Welcome. Thank you guys all for coming. My name is Ashley Andrews, and I'm part of the group Upper Valley Young Liberals that is hosting this. So um, I just wanted to say a little bit what Upper Valley Young Liberals is, in case some of you here don't know. Um, we are a group founded about four months ago by Nick Clark and a bunch of ex-Bernie Sanders uh, campaigners and people working in the West Lebanon office for Bernie, like Ali Hannigan, our vice chair, um, who's now working for Matt Dunn. And um, the, the mission of our, of our organization is to foster and encourage cultural and political participation from young people. Um, our group is not exclusive to young people, but we do try to push people under 35 to hold executive positions, um, try to get them into leadership roles that they might not otherwise be able to experience. And we've done a lot in the past four months. Um, we've had people elected as national delegates, including myself. Um, we have people running for office. We have people um, getting involved on the municipal level. So it's been really successful. And part of our model is that we have committees that branch off. And each committee, um, anything can be made into a committee if there's a member who has the desire or passion um, about a specific topic to do it. And Olivia LaPierre over here is extremely passionate about the environment and sustainability. And she came to us and started coming to meetings and said she was interested in doing a sustainability committee, um, which she has headed. And today, this is her first, the committee's first event. Thank you, Erin. And at the end, anybody who didn't see, she has a bunch of her stuff out in the um, entryway. It's all amazing, and I assume for sale. <laughs> so next we have Simon from the Center for Transformational Practices, which is right here in our backyard. Um, there's a really long paragraph here about it. Simon, do you want me to read? This is maybe what you had sent us or we pulled about the company. No, okay, I'll let you do the talking. Sure. Awesome, so come on up. excited to be here. I love this, uh, this stage, and uh, I was really excited to hear about this sustainability conference. Kudos to uh, all the people that pulled it together. Um, so what I, uh, I did pull together a PowerPoint presentation I want to share with you.
while we're waiting, maybe while we're waiting, we should consolidate. That might make it easier on future presenters as well. Should we just move everybody right here in the middle so we can all be kind of more? Is that, do you guys mind if we ask you to do that? Yeah. Felt a little sense of a critical mass give us something to do while we're killing time. <laughs> It's amazing that this picture here is coming out on the projector. Is that your desktop background? That's a desktop background. You have a, you know how to manage this uh, projector. There it is. There we go. Uh, yes. Hurrah. Okay, so my name is Simon Dennis, and I work for the uh, Center for Transformational Practice, and uh, which is just across the tracks, just behind the cover building back there. And what I want to talk to you about is the inner dimensions of sustainability movement. Uh, I am, uh, in general, uh, uh, focused, going to talk in very broad strokes about sustainability and about the kind of an overarching map of everything that we're up to. So, for instance, uh, uh, thinking about the different aspects of the sustainability movement and how they all fit together. So I know that you all are well aware of the legislative dimension. We were waiting on the edge of our street for, uh, on the edge of our seat for Obama to veto the XL pipeline. There is this domain of legislation, there is a domain of technology and infrastructure, all of these things which are, you know, have the, uh, the LED, the, the uh, the panels that we were talking about earlier, and possibly someday someone's going to create a uh, machine for sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And then in addition to that, we have also the geopolitical sphere. This is, uh, we saw a, a powerful demonstration of that with the uh, COP21 and the leaders of the, of the world showing, some would say, some degree of short-sightedness. So I would be, I'm, I do not want to take anything away from all of these uh, different dimensions of sustainability. But um, what I want to do is bring forward this other dimension here. This is the inner transformation aspect of sustainability. And uh, if you look at this list here, you can see that this, you could, cons you could graph, um, kind of group these as this, these first three in terms of the outer dimensions of sustainability and inner transformation as the inner, inner group. And you could think of them all together as kind of pillars that we hold up together. Now, this is not an exhaustive list at all. We're all there's also the whole social, social justice domain, restoring our uh, civic democracy, and, and a wide variety of other things. But this is just to give a little bit of a sampling of dimensions of the sustainability movement. And what I want to look at is the relationship between this element of inner transformation and these other aspects. Now, as I say, I come to you from the Center for Transformational Practice, so it should be a surprise to no one that I take a relatively transformational view. So this map, as it, from my perspective, looks like this here. It's, we have transformation uh, as the foundational element of this, and then on the basis of this, the whole legislation, technology, and geopolitical spheres on top of that. How can you make that argument? You could say that uh, the legislation, the technology, and the geopolitics, if they are operating from a close-hearted point of view, if they're operating from, they could be co-opted by people's individual selfish means, and thereby never get to the final destination of providing sustainable culture uh, that we're looking for. We've seen a lot of examples of that. This you could call this the transformational view that says that inner transformation is the foundation of the sustainability movement. And there's a slight variation on this view, which I'll share with you as well. Uh, as an aside, this is sort of the transformational view with collapse. This is for people who are focused a little bit on, uh, on the, the tenuous grasp that the US dollar has on the global reserve currency, or looking at the uh, diminishing um, availability of uh, cheap fossil fuels, and thinking we could be headed for some kind of major disruption. And these realms of geopolitics, technology, and um, legislation could shift in very unpredictable ways perhaps they could become less uh, uh, the clear line to sustainable culture than they are right now. So this is, this is transformational view with a twist. In con I set this aside. In contrast to this, we have what could be considered a more conventional view. And this is, uh, whether or not this is anybody here in the room's view, but this is sort of inner transformation as the afterthought. This to some extent reflects a focus on um, a funding focus and a time focus on these other spheres. 
And the idea is so we, we, we go directly into the realm of legislation, technology, geopolitics, create sustainable culture on the basis of that. And then once we have this new culture, then the, the, then we, uh, the inner dimension will come forward of its own accord. This is, um, we could call this a conventional, conventional view. Now, it's not my goal here to try and convince anybody um, of, uh, of one mapping over the other. This is your view, or this is your view. Either way, the, um, your commitment to one or the other of these is probably based on, a very, uh, on deeper commitments to a, a more fundamental worldview. <clears throat> That's what I want to talk about a little bit, the relationship between these different strategic elements of the sustainability movement and deeper philosophical commitments. I know you are all aware of this notion of the, the clockwork universe. This is a, uh, a, a view of reality, a view of the world, which views the universe as being a great big machine. This is uh, philosophical materialism in which the basic fundamental building blocks of reality boil down to uh, material. Matter is all that exists within the clockwork within the clockwork universe. And if you want to then explain inner dimensions, consciousness, you call it an epiphenomenon of neurons firing in the brain. Consciousness, thought, is all a product of, of neurons. This is the, the story about consciousness from the materialistic point of view. And uh, this may seem like the, the only logical point of view or a rational point of view, but actually if you study the history of it, this philosophy, this approach to reality has emerged in the past 250 years has kind of come into its into its glory, and um, and interestingly, at a very similar time when we're sowing the seeds of our ecological crisis. So um, before that, throughout um, many 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 different traditions, and uh, without within uh, the uh, coming forward from the wisdom of indigenous traditions, the world over, um, we have what could be called conscious universe approach. This is the notion of the um, universe as being born of consciousness. Uh, interestingly, this is uh, brought forward to us from the, from the uh, religious, the spiritual traditions, the wisdom traditions the world over. Now it's also being brought to us by the frontiers of science. So if you study the um, uh, implications of quantum mechanics, the movement away from this kind of Newtonian model of the way the universe um, works has been well underway since the early 1900s um, and, uh, and is now being pointed to from a very, very wide array of different uh, disciplines. For those of us who are holders of this particular understanding of the way reality works, I have to put a great premium on inner transformation. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by inner transformation in terms of the sustainability movement. So what is, what is inner transformation? What I want to propose to you is that in terms of the sustainability dialogue, we have two basic elements to it. And the first one we've already been talking about, story change. This is this notion of moving away from a mechanistic, materialistic understanding about the way in which reality is structured towards a more consciousness-based understanding of the way reality is structured. This could be called like the, the mega over story change that is taking place at this time. Uh, there's also a lot of sub story changes. You see a lot of shift. People talking about we need to, sh we need to shift to a new story about uh, business away from a kind of competition economics to a more collaborative economics. And that kind of theme also is reflected in other stories about evolution, stories about interpersonal relations, that type of thing. So there's a lot of sub-story changes. But for my purpose, I like to think about the shift between materialism to a consciousness base as being our macro mega story change, which is one of the one of the key aspects of the inner transformation of the sustainability movement. Next pillar is consciousness shift. And uh, by consciousness shift, these two are, are related with one another. They are subtly different. By consciousness shift, you could think of this in terms of the, um, you could say the raising up of consciousness or the deepening of consciousness, the deepening of our dwelling within the spectrum of our own being, opening of heart, 
opening of mind, broadening of our horizons, uh, waking up from the dream of matter, form, separation, building greater connection to the oneness that is life. Whatever you want to call it, consciousness shift is uh, a deepening of our connection with uh, the, with the interconnectivity of all of life. And you can imagine how this might be very important for the sustainability movement at a time when everything hinges on our ability to empathize with people who are further away from us. Let us say, people of future generations, people of um, living in the third world, other species. A lot hinges on our ability to call these other communities our own to empathize with us. So this kind of consciousness shift could be, could be understood as a driver. Let's think back to the geopolitics. Let's think back to, the tech, to the, our ability to whether or not we're going to use our technology for the betterment of humanity and, and all of life or for, or for individual enrichment. Uh, think about our legislation, our ability to use those, use those tools for the, for the betterment of, of all of life. Consciousness shift, story change are um, are two pillars um, that I'm that I think about as being sort of the foundational elements of the inner transformation of the sustainability movement. Does this have strategic implications for us as movement builders? I bet it does. Uh, and uh, so I'll, the way I like to think about how this plays out in terms of our work on the frontiers of the sustainability movement is uh, uh, in in a, in, a, in a three in terms of three tiers, three dimensions. We have the first tier, which is the most uh, closest to home, call it personal realm. If you look at the, your, own, your own relationship with your inner landscape through this lens, it becomes clear that whatever you do to cultivate that relationship is to some extent an offering to the planet as a whole. Is to some extent, you could say, a responsibility to the planet as a whole. I don't want to make any prescriptions about what that might be. Perhaps it could be. Uh, Spend time in nature, uh, spend time with people you love, you focus on eating healthy food, you might go to temple or synagogue, uh, you might lead, read up leading, uplifting literature, you might uh, engage in some kind of practice, maybe you make it to a meditation cushion once in a while, maybe you get enough sleep, maybe you take care of yourself. These are all things that, that have a very dramatic impact on your relationship with your inner, with your inner <coughs> Uh, if you look at these activities through the lens of radical in interconnectivity and this world emerging from oneness, it becomes clear that all of that is to some extent uh, a uh, responsibility and offering to the planet as a whole. Second dimension, group. Now group, our group dimension, this too is everything is changing in this realm as well. Gone are the days of the individual leader standing up and telling the group what to do. Here are the days of the collective wisdom of the group emerging within the context of the collective. The currency of change today is collective consciousness, collective creativity, collective action. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, this is reflected quite a bit in how, how Bernie has positioned his campaign. Right? This, is, this has very important implications to the way that we work together. When we get together as a group of young liberals, however it is, we are probably engaging in a way of conducting meetings which is designed to bring out, to, to lift up the, the collective consciousness of the group, which is designed to um, uh, build a sense of connectivity in which all voices are heard. Um, and uh, instinctively, we're doing things like, OK, let's check in before our meeting. Instinctively, we're doing things like, let's have a moment of silence before this meeting so that our, uh, the best of our thinking can come forward in the context of this meeting. Uh, instinctively, and this is also was reflected in the Occupy movement. They're, they were uh, deeply interested in, in deep democratic process, hand signals. To get the point, this is this is why it was expressed as a, a leaderful movement, right? Some said it was leaderless, but also definitely, we could say leaderful uh, in terms of in terms of deep de democratic process. This is part of what's emerging. This is part of our practice as change agents at this time, learning this new technology of how to be in groups. 
such a way that uh, surfaces the, the collective wisdom. I guess I'll add one more thing, which I hadn't thought to add, but I'll just say one more thing, is that very often the collective wisdom of the, of the group is wiser than any of the individuals who are there. Uh, so there again, we can come up with the solutions that are, that are truly powerful in this regard. Third dimension is the societal dimension. And here we have, um, what does the group do when it is, is going to have some impact? We put together, we say we're going to put together this conference. This is actually a societal intervention, this conference is. It's a brilliant idea that came out of, came out of individuals and a collective. And, and it is fundamentally non-divisive, let us notice, going on here. We have a very inclusive idea about sustainability here. We are not sowing seeds of further division within our community here. Uh, we are... Um, we are sowing seeds of togetherness. We are healing some of the deep fractures that are going on within our, within our society. And as people engaged in societal action, societal intervention, if we're keeping in mind the importance of consciousness shift, and we're keeping in mind the importance of story change and the impact we're trying to bring about, we have to be very sensitive to the way in which our actions can be divisive, the way in which our actions can set us up in a struggle with someone else whose behavior we're trying to change who then has to get defensive and marginalize us. And then we double down and demonize them. And notice what happens. We get this fissure down the middle of society in such a way that it ceases its, the ability, its ability to function very nicely together. And we've seen this quite a bit across the aisles in the, in the US Congress, to, as, as it's been stated quite a bit. The ability of functionality to, to plummet on the basis of one hand not being able to recognize its commonality with the other hand. These you can think of as three different, um, three different uh, frontiers. Each has its own specific technology. Each has its own specific uh, uh, work, and each is different. Uh, if we look at it through the from the standpoint, if we go back into our clockwork universe, we go back into our understanding of the world as a big machine. That suggests certain ways of proceeding, right? We inherit a movement building strategy from Marx. Marx is famously a great materialist who had a very confrontational movement building strategy. If we step into a, a, uh, a paradigm of oneness, a paradigm of deep interconnectivity at, at deeper levels of consciousness, we all of a sudden have new strategies for how we're going to relate with these three different dimensions. This is all being worked out. It's all being worked out by us, actually. We're all kind of in the lab, figuring out what works and what doesn't work within the context of this new paradigm. So slightly modified uh, version of our pillars that I'll bring, bring you back to is uh, this notion of uh, a substitute story change and consciousness shift for inner transformation. Those are relatively synonymous. And then on the basis of this, the, uh, the um, local economy, human scale technology, true democracy, and on the basis of this, the sustainable culture. This is a... Uh, a view of the path forward which um, suggests that if this is the foundation then the work that we do to strengthen these dimensions will be extremely fruitful with regards to our work as environmental activists. This is very good news for us because not only if, if this becomes the, the if, if this work at the personal group and societal dimensions becomes our um, the work of us as agents of, of sustainable culture. Um, it is also the work that we would do in terms of our own liberation. The work we would we would do in terms of our own uh, greatest contentment. And this is reflected at every level. Those ways that you take care of yourself and develop your inner landscape are the foundation of your happiness as a person. That work that you do in the group at the group level to cultivate the interconnectivity of the group is the foundation of not only the genius of the group coming forth, but also the happiness of the group, the connectivity. Can this group develop friendships? Is this group a hospitable place for us all to dwell? Now, ditto, let's think about this for the societal realm. That work that we do to create interve interventions for society also is, uh, is creating sense of place in the broader sense, creating towns, communities, regions that are the places we want to be and want to live. Of the, of the societal dimension. Um, this is very, all of these points we could go into in great, much greater detail, but this is sort of an overview of a, uh, 
transformational perspective uh, around uh, the sustainability movement. I'd be happy to take any questions if there are. Thank you. Thank you. Nick? Were there, um, can you remember any specific moments in your life where you had a realization that brought you towards this or towards sustainability, something that was sort of a for you? Yes, of course, of course. I mean, we all, we all have those moments, of course, uh, over the course of our lives, right? We're all in this process of waking up and uh, developing a, a, a correct, you know, true understanding. Um, I think, you know, rather, we could say we're actually having those moments every day, right? Our consciousness is always in this, in this flux of rising and falling. We pause for a moment, we see something, we recognize it as beautiful, we forget about ourselves for a moment. That's a totally different mindset than the kind of analytical mind. We're always in this, in this rise and fall. I like to pay attention to those moments, and certainly, yeah, I have some certain times in life where something kind of connected up and you're like, okay, there's no turning back. How about yourself and you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Does this, does this model connect up with uh, uh, perspective and work that you guys are engaged in? Yes. Without realizing it. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. You're thinking about these things with your Young, young liberals uh, work. Kind of yeah, it's been a, it's been a huge growing process for us um, because we're all from different realms. Um, we all view things differently, and we all have different passions and um, different ways that we think we can go about doing the things that we want to ultimately all achieve. And it's hard sometimes um, because we're cultural and political, and some people are on one side, and some people are on both sides. I think all of us are on both sides, but really. Um, doing and it's been a huge transformation of the group in the past two to three months and um, there's definitely growing pains of trying to bring it to a collective consciousness and to be on one page um, but I think the biggest thing is that we've just been using compassion to get through it and each, each, each meeting, each event is more and more coming together and connecting start to get to the bigger societal part of it once we solidify the group and we keep it. I think it's always changing on every level. I think it also comes down to so making sure that people understand whether cultural or political or sustainability or consciousness shift or true democracy, it comes down to how do you foster that sense of collective responsibility? How do you get people to understand that they have an investment in the states regardless of what the states are? So I think that that's really what EBL is trying to learn and to um, bring about to create change. You have to make people care, which I'm sure you're up against as well. I think that that's our strength is that we care. It's just making how to make other people care as well. Yeah, I think it's a good start. John? You said that we're, we're like working it out. It's like a big experiment. How, how do you think the experiment's going? Well, so people could cite, people could cite um, a kind of lack of continuity with the, within the Occupy movement um, for sort of setbacks within this sort of dimension of work. Uh, to me, to me, this particular experiment, like if I say this is the foundation, then, then I say whatever is working is working for this reason, right? I have a board of directors for the Center for Transformational Practice. We have a, uh, a fantastic board, and the board is, it is strife-free. It is stress-free. People, people love to come to our board meetings, right? They're dying to put down the busyness and the care of the rest of there so they can enter into that, into that deeper field. Uh, and the board has been the board has been very very effective from that regard. So I'd say in that regard, how is it working? Uh, in, in 
in that it's, it's working very well. Uh, anytime I find myself in a meeting space which leaves a gap for silence to take place, I know that we're going to come up with something good. Anytime I find myself in a collective meeting space that has like one person starting to speak before the other person's finished speaking, I know that we're spinning our wheels. I've had that experience over and over again. Yeah? It sounds similar to sort of Quaker consensus and Quaker meetings. I went to a Quaker high school. They would you know, start the silence of the meetings and sometimes take them hours to scratch out. You know, it's, it's, it's often been noticed that the Quakers, given the size of the Quaker movement, this Quaker organization, the impact in terms of social change has been, has been outsized, right? They've been powerful change agents. And it is linked back to their process. The, the wisdom, the recognition of how it is that, that uh, uh, powerful, powerful movements and powerful groups can be formed. Yeah. Um, so it, being a history and a biology guy, or originally, long story, anyway, no, I'll get down that path, but anyway, um, I see a lot of different kind of ties to what you've been saying to kind of like human evolution. Like I, I mean, it's hard for us to, s to say this for sure, but it seems like some of the first cultures that humans had as a collective society were very similar to what we're striving for today but we didn't have these technologies very in tune to nature, very close to the earth and close to each other because it was a survival, necessi necessary for survival. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering, from your perspective, how much of this change that we're striving for, this cultural, sustainable cultural change, is change and how much of it is going back to our roots? And how much of it is actually us needing, I mean, there's obviously some change that needs to happen now that we have technology and these big cities and stuff. There's ways you have to work all those into this. But how much of it, in your perspective, is that? And how much of it is us just waking up and realizing, crap, this, somehow we deviated off the path that whatever the powers that be may be are was trying to put us on being on this earth. Yeah, I think if you're if you're suggesting that it's that it comes down to our ability to go back to our roots, I I tend to agree with you. What is our root? Right. Right. We go back to our hearts. Right. That is that puts us in uh, in strong footing in whatever we do. That gives us a basis to act and care for the environment, care for one another. Create, create just relationships between people and, and create a uh, social order which can endure long term in the future. So from that standpoint, uh, if that's what you mean by going back to our roots, I'd say to some extent it's kind of 100% about that in a way and everything that spills out still is the legislation, technology, and all of that as it, as it spills out from there. I don't, I don't necessarily think that I mean, and there are ways that we are going. We, we are going to need to become re-indigenous to this land. We are going to need to become re-people of the land. You know, the way that the way that the indigenous people were. But I don't personally subscribe to a going backwards. We are where we are. It's we're going forwards. I guess I have to that. I guess a better way to explain what I was trying to get at is instead of going backwards, bringing some of the old practices back into play rather than going back to that time, more of looking back on that time and saying, all right, this worked, um, and somehow culture has gotten away from that. Let's take those things that worked back then and bring them back into play, and then the things that work today and to make a whole new yeah. culture. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's been emphasized quite a bit by the Transition Town Movement. And it also puts us in position to as the transition town movement says, to honor our elders that still know how to can vegetables. And, you know, still our, uh, the people who lived through the depression and have that consciousness or whatever are an invaluable resource to the, to the sustainability movement, as, the, as are the young people as well. So um, 
last thing I'll say is that if you are if you are finding yourself in this in this camp with regards to how you think about movement building or in this camp with regards to how you think about the structure of the universe, um, you are in increasingly good company. Um, which is to say that um, uh, we've been hearing, like we hear from uh, uh, change leaders, global change leaders, like Aung San Suu Kyi, pro-democracy activist in Burmese, uh, the, the, uh, the true revolution is the revolution of the spirit, and that was picked up uh, in the same year by Václav Havel. These are two people who are Nobel laureates who have, done, who have created enormous global movements, and they were bringing this message forward very, very clearly. Uh, nowadays, it's moved into the mainstream. We hear Eckhart Tolle re uh, repeatedly referring to the environmental crisis as a spiritual crisis, and, th and that was uh, echoed again in the encyclical, Pope Francis also saying the same thing. To some extent, everywhere you look, it seems like these connections are being made in a lot of different ways. It's, hard to, it's happening in so many diverse ways that it's hard to connect the dots. But uh, it is, uh, it's exciting to be kind of thinking at at this, I, I work with a lot of people that are pushing, actually working pretty hard on figuring out this technology and, and figuring out the networks that will express it and helping to get this message forward, helping to transfer the philanthropy sector to be taking this into account uh, and, uh, and, and recognizing that, boy, in 2016, we're in a different world than we were even 2014. And just, you know, from here, it seems like we're, uh, we're at a steep part of the hockey sticks anyway. Thank you all for, uh, Listen to me, I did.